Chapter 2, Updating the Church This liberal Catholic claimed he was a faithful child of the Church, but he said that since mankind had come of age, everything in the Church must be brought in line with the spirit of our age, the spirit of modern man. Triumphant liberty will crush anyone who attempts to resist it, so the Church had better welcome it with open arms. Our liberal Catholic got quite worked up as he laid out these wonders. He proclaimed that no one could possibly object, since he was merely giving expression to reason and faith and the spirit of the age. As for the spirit of the age, nobody argued with him. When he evoked faith and reason, we never tired of presenting our objections. But he shrugged his shoulders and always managed to have the last word. I must say that sweeping assertions and the most outrageous contradictions didn't seem to faze him. Imperturbable, he proclaimed that he was a Catholic, a child of Holy Mother Church, and a faithful child at that, but that he was also a man of his time, member of an adult humanity that had come of age and was ready to govern itself. When presented with historical arguments, he responded that, Mankind come of age was a new world, and which proofs from history no longer apply, which didn't stop him from using historical arguments of his own when the occasion arose. When presented with citations from the fathers of the church, sometimes he would produce quotes of his own. Sometimes he said that the fathers spoke for their time, and we must speak for ours. In the face of scriptural texts, he used the same tactic. Either he reinterpreted any texts which seemed to contradict his own theories, or he came up with some commentary to give our text a more favorable spin as a last resort. He objected that such a thing was all very well for the Jews and their particular little Jewish state. He would not let himself be bothered by dogmatic bulls from the Roman Curia, either. The bull Unum Sanctum, translator's note, Unum Sanctum is the bull on papal supremacy and on the necessity of belonging to the church in order to be saved, published in 1302 by Pope Boniface VIII. It establishes the divine origins of authority and so emphasizes the primacy of the spiritual order over the secular. It develops the medieval image of the two swords representing the spiritual and secular powers. The spiritual sword is wielded by the clergy, while the secular sword is at the service of the spiritual and under its direction, and all things subject to the judgment of the church. End translator's note. By Boniface the Eighth only made him smile. He claimed it had since been annulled or revised. We told him that the popes had inserted it into canon law, and there it is to this day. He responded, That's awfully old, and the world has completely changed. He also considered to be old, the bull in China Domini, and those that followed. Translator's note, Traditionally published by the Pope on Holy Thursday, the Feast of the Lord's Supper, the Bull in China Domini, as a list of those guilty of heresy or of a variety of criminal acts or acts of flagrant impiety, along with the censures incurred. Urban VIII, in 1644, definitively established the form of this bull, but the first of its kind dates from the 14th century. Each bull remains in effect until another officially replaces it. End translator's note. Those are disciplinary formulas meant for their time, he said, and they no longer have any purpose today. The French Revolution buried those rules along with the world they kept in chains. All constraint is abolished. Man today is capable of liberty and will have no other law. This regime, he continued in his prophetic tone, which unsettles the 
timid of hearts like yourselves, is nonetheless the one to save the church, and indeed the only one. Moreover, the human race is rising up to impose it on all of us, and you will have no choice but to submit. In fact, it has already been imposed. Just see if there is anyone who can place the smallest obstacle in the path of this triumphant force. If anyone even wants to. If anyone except you even imagines doing such a thing. You intolerant Catholics are more absolutist than God the Father, who created man for liberty. You are more Christian than God the Son, who only wished to establish the new law of the gospel by liberty. You are even more Catholic than the Pope, because by his approval the Pope himself consecrates these modern constitutions, which are all of them inspired and filled with the spirit of liberty. I tell you that the Pope, the Vicar of Jesus Christ, approves these constitutions, because he gives you permission to bind yourself to them by oath, to obey and defend them. But they contain religious liberty. They contain the atheistic state. The world must follow this rote. You will, too, mark my words. So why wear yourself out fighting it? Resistance is useless. Your reluctance to let go of the past isn't only madness. It is tragic. It makes people hate the church, and it hinders us in our work. Us liberals, your saviors. Because it makes people doubt our sincerity. Rather than drawing certain and terrible defeat upon yourselves, hasten toward liberty. Hail her, welcome her, love her. She will be a good and faithful friend for you, and will bring you more than you could ever call back from the past. The faith hobbles beneath the yoke of a protective authority. She will stand up tall if she is forced to defend herself, and an impassioned struggle will breathe new life into her. But will the church not undertake once she is given free reign to undertake everything? How will she melt the hearts of nations? Once they see her abandoned by the powerful of this world and living only by her own ingenuity and virtue. Amidst the confusion of doctrines and the explosion of immorality, she alone will shine forth as embodying purity and goodness. She will be the final refuge and unassailable rampart of morality, of the family, of religion, indeed of liberty itself.